I'm Dom Nichols, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we bring you news from across the front lines and hear from Dr. Daria Mattingly on the Holodomor, the Soviet-engineered famine in Ukraine in 1932-33. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. If we give President Zelensky the tools, the Ukrainians will finish the job. Slava Ukraini! Nobody is going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday, we sit down with leading journalists from The Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Wednesday, the 27th of December, One year and 306 days since the full-scale invasion began. Today, it's just me, Associate Editor for Defence, Dom Nichols, with what's been happening over the past few days, and later, an interview with Dr Daria Mattingly. I started with the updates from the last few days. So the big thing from the last few days, you would have seen it, this huge explosion in the harbour of um, Theodosia, that's on the southeast corner of Crimea, about 3 a.m. local time yesterday, after missiles, most likely British-supplied Storm Shadow or French Scalp cruise missiles, same thing basically, um, struck the Novichokask, which is one of Russia's amphibious landing ships there. Now, in a rare move, Sergei Shoigu, Russia's defence minister, personally told Putin about the strike shortly before uh, Putin was due to meet with leaders from former Soviet states at a big summit in St. Petersburg. So Dmitry Peskov, the Kremlin spokesman, said Shoigu reported about the strike that the Ukrainians carried out on Feodosia and about the damage to our large landing ship. It was a very detailed report. I'm sure it was a very detailed report. There were bits all over the place. Anyway, that strike on the Novichokask, which is thought to be the seventh warship in the uh, in Russia's Black Sea fleet that Ukraine has has destroyed, was the most destructive hit against the Black Sea fleet since September. When you may remember another, we think another Storm Shadow missile hit and destroyed a submarine that was being repaired in the dry dock in um, Sevastopol. Now, this one was very interesting. That the Feodosia is on the far the far end is about ten k's only the ish from the Kirsch Bridge. So it just shows what can be done if there were more of them, basically. Grant Shapps, Britain's Defence Secretary, said the latest destruction of Putin's navy demonstrates that those who believe there's a stalemate in the Ukraine war are wrong. He carried on, they haven't noticed that over the past four months, 20% of Russia's Black Sea fleet has been destroyed. I'd have to do the maths there and try and work out what's what. But I think the point he's making is um, the the one that we've been said we've been saying for a while ago that war is much bigger than a than a a largely frozen land campaign. You've got to look at the wider the wide the whole wider piece and Ukraine that doesn't really have a navy to effectively defeat the Black Sea Fleet is is quite something. Defeat does not mean destroy every single ship, sink the lot. It means that they're no longer you render them militarily ineffective. And that's effectively what's happened. Now, Ukrainian officials said that the Novichokask was carrying Shahid drones from Iran when it was hit, which possibly accounts for why it was so so colourful. President Zelensky thanked the Ukrainian Air Force for the successful missile strike and said Novichokask had been sunk. He said, I'm grateful to our Air Force for the impressive replenishment of the Russian underwater Black Sea Fleet with another vessel. I've seen reports during the rounds that up to 90 Russians 9-0 were killed. I've got no way of verifying that. I mean, it it was a a huge explosion. So the the initial report that there was one missing sailor, I think, is is just not going to be not going to be correct. When we if if we ever get any kind of verifiable data out of out of Russia, but I mean, 90 is 90 is a a large number. Could easily have been in and around the ship, but uh, yeah, no way of verifying that. Elsewhere, the other big news over the weekend was the loss of territory by Ukraine. So Ukrainian forces have mostly left the destroyed town of Marinka. This is in the eastern Donbass region, just about 10 k's due west of Donetsk City itself. Kyiv confirmed the, the loss of the first major town since May, which has got to be Bakhmut and the Wagner efforts there. General Valery Zeluzny, the um, uh, Ukrainian head of the armed forces, said there's nothing controversial about the fact that Ukrainian soldiers have stepped back to the outskirts of the town of Marinka. This is a war. 
So the fact that we have now retreated to the outskirts of Marinka and set up positions behind Marinka in some areas is nothing that can cause any public outcry. I mean, interesting, he, he's sort of a bit with his um, the big interview he did with The Economist where this phrase stalemate was doing the rounds a few weeks ago. I mean, he, he's, he, I think General Zaluzny has adopted the policy that just sort of say it as it is to the, to the public. I'm not suggesting that the, um, that the politicians don't necessarily do that, but he's, he's pretty upfront about this. You know, he's talking about giving ground there. He says there's nothing controversial about it. So, I mean, agreed, you sometimes have to go backwards, to go forwards later. But, I mean, he is, he's not, not hiding it. Now, pro-Russia rebel forces in Donetsk apparently have already issued a commemorative stamp for this conquest featuring a swallow, which they said represents rebirth and renewal. Like, well done, that's the place is absolutely smashed to bits, but, you know, you give us, get a stamp. General Zaluzny, he has been, as I say, he's casting a bit more of a downbeat tone. Elsewhere, across the southern front, Russian forces were... Uh, have advanced in some areas and been pushed back in others. Not a lot of movement at all. Down on the left bank of the Dnipro, not an awful lot has, has changed there. Russian forces thought to be dropping grenades filled with tea, tear gas, CS gas. Analysts have said that Russia has been dropping the K-51 grenades with CS gas, which basically uses a crowd control explosive, really. It makes your eyes water, difficult to breathe, all the rest of it. Saying that they're now using these to impact the Ukrainian forces there on the left bank which I've got to ask, because they say, well, why not explosives? I mean, have they, have they run out? It'd be an interesting, if they're using CS gas, why would they go to that trouble if they could use high explosive? Elsewhere in the last few days, Ukraine shot down, we think, five very sophisticated Russian fighter bomber jets. We don't know if they're all the Su-24s. There were three reported down in one day. We don't know if all five are Su-24s, but there have been five kills of Russian jets. They seem to have shot down every advanced missile and most of the drones. There has been a notable reduction in the in the Russian use of glide bombs across the south. That's probably a consequence of losing the aircraft they have and the the ones that remain thinking, right, better adjust our tactics or have a have a think about what's going on here. So it has had an, an immediate effect there. Then in the last 24 hours, Russian forces bombed a railway station full of people in Herzon. That was late yesterday. Killed at least one, wounded others. This is from Ukrainian officials. Anyone who wants to have a go, then please let me know what military target there was to be had in a railway station full of civilians. Oh, that's right, yeah, because somebody had a pizza once with a somebody in uniform, undoubtedly. Now, drone and artillery strikes across the rest of the south th- thought to have killed at least five others. Interior Minister Ihor Klemenko said about 140 people were waiting for an evacuation train from Herzon. Police lieutenant helping organise that effort there was killed. Two more police officers and civilians wounded by shrapnel. Ukrainian railway operator uh, Ukrazalnitsia said that the, the civilians were then evacuated on buses to Mikhailayev, the neighbouring oblast. They said the situation is under control. The railroad is back to normal operation. Uh, they put that on a statement on Telegram. And those passengers targeted last night, the civilians were said to have arrived in Kyiv this morning. Now, according to local media reports, Russian forces had attacked throughout Herzon area uh, for a few hours late yesterday. The oblast governor, Alexander Podukin, he had reported um, civilian deaths around noon in the village of Mikilske. That's about 20 k's northeast of, of Herzon city. And you'll remember since it was, uh, since liberation, about 400 civilians have been killed and 1,700 around, wounded around Herzon, according to local authorities. Now, taking a little uh, step backwards, the first cohort of Ukrainian pilots to receive training from Britain's RAF are now learning to, they're moving on to the F-16 jets in Denmark, having completed basic training here in the UK. This is an announcement out today from Britain's MOD. Once they've completed their training with the RAF pilots, um, they move on to other European nations for more advanced flying training. That will eventually prepare them for training on the F-16. This effort overseen by Denmark, the Netherlands and the US, the US which leads this Air Force Capability Coalition. There are some suggestions, there's been a bit of news the last couple of days, that the jets may already be in Ukraine, which is possible. I would expect any official announcements, this kind of stuff, such as today's from the MOD, uh, to have been a little bit behind reality for security purposes. So there may may already be F-16s in in Ukraine, and I I would have I would doubt if they would be there, just sitting there, albeit in a hardened aircraft shelter or similar. 
before they could be used. So if they're there, I would have thought the whole program, I thought that the news that we're getting is probably some weeks behind reality. So you might find F-16s in the air soon. But that's speculation and analysis rather than any uh, any news I've seen. Separately, um, Navalny, Alexei Navalny has been found, imprisoned Russian opposition leader. He uh, managed to get uh, send out a pretty upbeat Christmas message. He'd, he'd gone missing for 20 days, moved from one prison to another before reappearing in a remote Arctic prison. He's now, he was moved through various routes to um, the snow-swept IK-3 penal colony. This is about 1,200 miles northeast of Moscow, known as Polar Wolf. He, um, he's got a new beard, apparently, Navalny. He says, uh, I'm your new Santa Claus and now live above the Arctic Circle in the village of Karp on Yamal. Put out a post on, on Twitter. What do you say? I don't say ho, 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 but I do say o o o o. When I look out of the window where I can see a night, then the evening and then another night. Unfortunately, there are no reindeer, but there are huge, fluffy and very beautiful shepherd dogs. OK, so he seems in good spirits. His people, lawyers and friends close to him were were very concerned. They lost contact with him for three weeks. He is the, the most prominent domestic rival of Putin. He voluntarily went back to the country a couple of years ago, knew he was going to be locked up. He's been found... Well, he's serving a 19-year sentence for, a, for, for conviction, for, God, well, make up whatever you like, as they did. And then a couple more. Russia has redirected its oil exports from Europe to China and India. This is from Russia's Deputy Prime Minister Alexander Novak. Um, he's speaking earlier on today. This is obviously the sanctions on Russia are, are having some effect. I did that bit last week when I was with some US senior US Treasury officials giving the update on how the sanctions are biting. Go and find that one. I think that was last Wednesday or Thursday. You'll find that one. But basically, um, so the Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister Novak has said, We previously supplied... Okay, right, get the maths ready. Get the pencils ready. We previously supplied a total of 40 to 50% of all oil and oil products to Europe. The main partners in the current situation are China, whose share has grown to approximately 45 to 50%, and India. In two years, the total share of supplies to India has come to 40%. Right, so do the maths there. 50-odd-ish to China, 40-odd-ish to India. I've said before on the final Defence in Depth video of this series, it will be back next year, but have a look on YouTube. I said that there's a there's a reckoning for an economy that is pumped up on on war steroids. Twenty twenty four, the Russian Russia's economy will, will have will spend one third on defence, and the figures you've just seen there, it, it's essentially just a gas station for China and India. You know that that is unsustainable. So you know, let's see what happens to the uh, to the Russian economy. And it's basically Putin has mortgaged his future to China and India as just a cheap supplier of, of fuel. So a complete win for him, a strategic genius. Now then, Ukraine's Defence Minister Rustam Umarov has been talking about the about manpower issues generating personnel for, for the front. This ongoing debate, the, the controversial debate about do you mobilise your society so you know, the, the economy then effectively ceases and you risk wiping out the generation of youngsters that have to rebuild the the country. But in an existential fight, maybe that's what you need to do. And you'll remember that President Zelensky was talking last week about this request from the military for up to about half a million soldiers. And he said he needed more detail. So Umarov's been talking about that. He said, this is an interview with, with Ukrainian media, he said that Ukrainian military and civilian officials are developing a more transparent recruitment process that will more clearly communicate to the public how one joins military service, how you go through training, issues about leave, and then how your service is, is ended. He said there would be no demobilisation until after the war is over, implying there'd always be a reserve commitment. So if you do time at the front, you then may be called up again. But that Ukraine must find solutions to provide rest and partial partial release from military service. He said that Ukrainian officials are trying to improve bureaucratic force generation systems by unifying databases and streamlining systems. So he's talking about these plans that Zelensky was referring to last week. He said that they're going to, his MOD, his Ministry of Defence, will soon submit the plan on how a mobilisation of another 450 to 500,000 people would work. He didn't disclose the nature of the plan or the, the numbers that would come through in tranches or how that's all going to work. But he said that the MOD will propose 
a 25 to 60 age range in terms of drafting uh, men only if Ukrainian society accepts the arguments behind the proposal. At the moment, the current lower age, lower end is 20, which is quite high. And he said, he also talking about the defence industrial base and what's going to happen there, in particular, the development of drones. And he said that the Ukraine is beginning to work with several hundred drone manufacturers to improve the, the quantity and the quality and the bureaucracy of getting these things into service. You may remember President Zelensky in that interview back on December 19th, he said that Ukraine intends to produce a million drones in 2024. So, I mean, if you just look at the, the impact of the first-person view drones, these ones that are piloted into the target, then you, you can see how, how those are the kind of numbers you need to be talking about. OK, I've been going on for a little bit now. Um, so it's going to be a bit of a shorter, shorter update today. So I'm just going to, unless anyone else has anything to add. No, nope, nothing here because I'm the only one. I will go to my own final thoughts. And I, uh, as I have done before, I do recommend you follow Steve Rosenberg, the BBC's Moscow correspondent. Obviously, he's working under extreme, well, pressure and scrutiny. So... A lot of people say, oh, what's the point in having a, having a Moscow correspondent because you can't say anything? Well, I think he says quite a lot, actually. If you look at, look at what he says and how he says it, I think it, there is a very good... He's very good at getting messages out. He's been looking at the Russian papers today. In, well, he does every day, but in particular, he was looking at any, for any reaction about the, um, the strike in Fedosia, the loss of another landing ship by the Russia's Black Sea fleet. And he said there's almost no mention of it whatsoever. A couple of very generic lines absolutely buried in the paper in all the papers. But he did highlight Russia's government paper, the uh, Russoskaya Gazeta, that has an interview with Sergei Karaganov, who's a Russian foreign policy expert, former Kremlin advisor. He's a, a guy who's previously called for a preemptive nuclear strike on Europe. So, you know, no shrinking violet when it comes to Russian strategic thought. But he, Karaganov, was saying some interesting things. He was saying in this interview that Russia has liberated the world from the Western yoke, the West is lowering the Iron Curtain. He went on, by restraining the West, this, of course, is the whole narrative that it's all, all the West's fault and fortress Russia is against the world and, yeah, fine, yada, yada, yada. But I just, you know, listen to his words. By restraining the West and by building relations with brotherly China, we are now becoming the axis of the earth. We have joined the battle to save the world. We don't need the West now. We have taken everything we could have from this wonderful European journey that Peter the Great began. Now we need to return home. He was talking about developing Siberia and, um, yeah, fine. But I thought there was very interesting words there, not only because of who he is, but also because nothing happens in these papers, certainly not um, Rossiskaya Gazeta without, without the, the Kremlin seal of approval. So this fella talking about... Um, I mean, of course, putting it in the context that the West is lowering the Iron Curtain and they've got to retreat behind it and all the rest of it. But talking about relations with brotherly China, we, and we don't need the West now, we've taken everything from it. And that phrase, now we need to return home. Uh, you know, I'm not suggesting that this is in any way a prelude to Putin coming out tomorrow and saying, and declaring victory, because of course he, he can do what he likes. He's a dictator. Everyone has to believe it or just put up with it. So he can say what he likes. He can end this war tomorrow and return home. Everyone knows that, that he's had his, mil his land military utterly decimated, but he could declare victory, fine. But he would, in order to sell it to the public, there'd need to be a, a compelling narrative. So all this talk about NATO and Finland joining and Sweden and all the rest of it, it's all about, oh, they're all, they're all against us, the classic bully in the playground. They're all against us. But this narrative that they've taken everything they need from the West, they can turn away, this Iron Curtain's descended again, we can return home. It is interesting. And I just wonder if over the next few weeks, and certainly in the run-up to March's presidential election, let's see how, how Putin frames this, just in case there's the first little inclination there that they might be trying to set the narrative for some sort of declare victory and all, all run home, a bit like they did in Afghanistan. Thank you, Don. A few weeks ago, I spoke to lecturer Daria Massingly. Daria studies and writes about the Holodomor, the man-made famine that ravaged Ukraine and other regions of the Soviet Union in the 1930s. The Holodomor is a pivotal, tragic and deadly event in Ukrainian history that overshadows so much modern development's history and politics. I spoke to Daria about the history of the Holodomor, collectivization, and how the famine transformed Ukraine. Here's Daria Massini. 
Daria, thank you so much for your time. Would you just introduce yourself and your work? Uh, my name is uh, Daria Martingley. I'm an affiliated lecturer in Slavonic Studies at the University of Cambridge and a lecturer in European history at the University of Chichester. This is where I am now. And my research is primarily on Soviet history and the 1932-33 famine, known as the Holodomor in particular. How do you start even talking about it when you introduce your work and research to people? Where do you begin to explain the Holodomor? When I'm talking to public, to general audience, it is very tempting for me to contextualize the famine within broader modern history of Ukraine as one attempt in a series of attempts by Russia to control Ukraine, to subdue Ukraine, to bring it under its command. And a series of wars, be it the famine or a war of attrition or the current Russia-Ukrainian war, we see the metropole, Moscow, the Kremlin, exercising and pursuing policies that are to bring Ukraine under control and for a variety of reasons. Let's start by contextualizing it then. Could you sketch out for us the political and economic context ahead of the Holodomor, so in the early 1930s maybe? I would sketch the political and economic context um, ahead of the 1930s by going back to the October Revolution or coup d'etat, by looking at how the Russian Empire collapsed. But did it really collapse or was the Soviet Union reintroduction of the empire when Moscow lost, or should I say St. Petersburg, Petrograd lost Finland and Poland, but yet in 1919 established a full grip on Ukraine, where local population, be it ethnic Ukrainians or Jews, did not support Bolsheviks en masse. In fact, they did not vote for them for the Constituent Assembly that was to take place in 1918, but was obviously closed down by the Bolsheviks. There was no support for the Bolsheviks on the ground. And in fact, 1919 is the year of the great peasant uprising, which was primarily a Ukrainian uprising, against the Bolsheviks' rules and authorities. And Stalin in particular, he was the Commissar in National Affairs in Ukraine at the time. He was acutely aware of how potent Ukrainian national movement was and how dear it was the cost to the Bolsheviks of crashing the uprising in Ukraine. So we have new economic policy that followed and indigenization policy, or Karinizatse in Ukraine and the Soviet Union. And it was in a way, and I interpret it as many other historians, as a concession or compromise between the Bolsheviks and the non-Russian republics and non-socialist part of the society, which was the majority of the society. And we know that Bolsheviks did not win. It was not a popular win of the election, how they came to power. So it was a concession to appease non-supportive population. And in Ukraine, we see that concession went too far, according to Stalin, when non-ethnic Ukrainians, and we're talking about political Ukrainians, uh, the birth of political nation at the time, came up with uh, slogans and mottos to get away from Moscow. So there was a national revival in a way that led to concerns um, in Moscow, in the Kremlin, and in Petrograd. And uh, we see imperial project rebounding, um, which coincided with the ascension of Stalin in 1929 and the launch of collectivization, which was fiercely opposed in Ukraine and more so than in Russia proper or anywhere else in the Soviet Union. The number, the sheer number of uprisings or mutinies or whatever you call it, the disobedience and the sabotage, to use um, contemporary language at the time, the collectivization was raising concerns. It reminded of 1919 peasant uprising when there were a number of districts in Ukraine where those mutinous Ukrainians were just expelling and getting rid of social officials and security services were reporting to Stalin that in some places there is no Soviet rule at all. 
So drastic measures were needed. And as we have collectivization already devastating agriculture and the countryside everywhere and the famine that followed in the Soviet Union, we see uh, the famine is used as a tool in Ukraine in particular when grain procurement quotas for Ukraine are set at absolutely unrealistic level. They were lowered three times, but they were never met. And that is the policy that led to the famine in Ukraine in 1932-33 that claimed lives of almost 4 million men, women, and children. So that is the political and economic context. So we have a devastated countryside, the famine looming large in many parts of the Soviet Union, and uh, we have people resisting collectivization. So certain measures need to be done to keep Ukraine in fold. And we see Darwin telegraphing his envoys in Ukraine, Kaganovich and Molotov, to say that we have to make Ukraine an exemplary fortress, otherwise we might lose it. So that is the situation on the eve of the famine known as the Holodomor. You've mentioned collectivization quite a few times, and it's a key policy uh, involved in the Holodomor. Could you just, let's be very clear, what, what was collectivization? Why did they impose it? And what was the reaction? So collectivization, when we say collectivization, we usually refer to creation of collective farms, so where both um, implements, the land and cattle and everything pretty much collectivized. It's brought together into larger farms where farmers are no longer private owners but collective farm employees and in case of the soviet union collectivizing so bringing together into collective ownership uh, of land and implements in practice was state ownership so collective farmers no longer were owning their tools of production implements different tools or even in some cases they did not have even vegetable plots. So in effect, you stay in your home, but uh, you no longer work for yourself. There were no provisions, social welfare uh, or any pensions or any salary, in fact. So as a collective farmer, you would be working at a bigger farm, which would unite most people in your village. The land would belong to the state, but on paper, it would belong to the collective. But it was socialist property, so it was the state. And you would not be paid any salary. You would not have a retirement pension. All you would receive is part of the produce after procurement by the state, what was left of the produce that you worked hard on the whole year, would be split between the collective farmers and they would be able to sell it on the collective farmers market for money. And the payment would be based on the number of days that you worked at the collective farms, which sometimes the amount of work for day would be split across a few days. So it wasn't even for the, you're not paid daily rate and you're not paid in monetary terms either. So that led to many collective farmers compare that to serfdom because he still owed some work to the state or lord of the manor in the past, or the state in the past, as well as Russian pie, because there were state-owned peasants, and he would not be paid. You are not entitled to passport. He wouldn't be able to leave the collective farm. It was a form of slavery, and we see that in the articulated by Ukrainian peasants in 1930s very clearly. And I wouldn't be surprised if it was articulated elsewhere in the Soviet Union. That what it was. It was called second serfdom. You've given us the context, talked about the policies. So let's talk about what happened. The Colored Moon didn't start overnight. As we mentioned, collectivization preceded it. Collectivization provided the state with a really good channel to procure, to remove foodstuffs and every agricultural produce, be it meat, milk, or fruit, or grain primarily, from the countryside. So if you work as a collective farmer and the collective farm, all produce is stored at the collective farm in storehouses or in the fields. And when it is removed from the countryside, procured by the state to use for export or to feed the army or the cities, it is taken primarily from the collective farm. You don't have the opportunity to hide it anywhere. 
without even the hindsight knowledge, peasants were acutely aware what it meant for them. So the state was at will to decide who would eat and who would not eat, who would have anything to save for winter and who would not. In the 1930s, we have many acts of resistance across the whole of Ukraine. And we have, by 1931, already the famine taking place in some parts of uh, Ukraine as well as the USSR. So when we're talking about all Soviet famine, we're talking about 1931-34. But what happens in 1932, which uh, makes um, the Holodomor, the famine within the famine, is setting up the quotas specific to Ukraine for the 1932-33 grain procurement. They were lowered three times, never met. Only 60% approximately of the quotas uh, were met, so 60% of the whole total number of grain to be procured. And it was primarily grain. And as we know from history, European history in particular, bread uh, was still a staple food that hungry years saved many. It was carbohydrates and grain in particular, and flour-based cuisine in Ukraine as well. So it was a very stodgy, carbohydrate-rich cuisine, and that's what people consumed at the time. So once you remove bread, people would rely on foodstuffs they have in stock somewhere in their pantries and the basement and so on. If you remove those, you would reduce people to seeking food elsewhere in the fields. So what was done in 1932, just before the grain procurement, there was a legislative act called the Law on Five Years of Grain, prohibiting people from accessing crops in the fields. They would be accused of gleaning or theft of socialistic property and prosecuted. Um, you could get a term between two to 10 years in camps or in prison. That setting of agricultural quotas, grain procurement quotas, in July 1932 in Kharkiv, it was um, brought by Peganovich and Molotov to Kharkiv for the Republican leadership of uh, Ukraine. And of course, everybody understood, and there was a much criticism from district officials in Ukraine that it was unrealistic and there was already a starvation in Ukraine and it was impossible. It was just sentenced people to death. Yet after a few days of that conference in which these grain procurement quotas were discussed or targets, Kaganovich and Molotov were sending telegraphs to Stalin, and he was replying them straight away to insist on those targets. And in case of the Holodomor, we can compare that conference to one conference in Germany, where the fate of the whole solution of Ukrainian question was decided and sealed. So they pushed for those quotas, which provided the state with legal ground to persecute those who would not abide, who would not follow the orders. And even though the number of, um, of rank and file perpetrators who were executed for not following the orders is abysmally low, less than 1% of those who were tried and convicted of disobedience, we still have the same mechanism of how it was executed, the famine, I mean, just in comparison with other cases of genocide and mass violence of state sanctioned mass violence. When people do participate because they're obedient to the authorities, they profiteer or they're vulnerable in effect because uh, they are scared of their families to be famished and to die of starvation. So we have all kinds of motivation why people participated in 1932-33 grain procurement, but that's what happened from autumn till spring, when all foodstuffs, all valuables were removed from the population that could be exchanged for food. And uh, we see people dying en masse in spring 1933. So that was why and how the Holodomor started in terms of mechanism, but also was the precedent of widespread resistance acts. In 1930, we see the rationale um, behind exacerbating the already existing famine and reducing population to basic instant of survival, which would be very easy to control. Dari, if we were to travel through rural Kharkiv region in 1932-1933, what would we see? You would see, and we know that from the accounts of the 
uh, witnesses, such as Gareth Jones, Bria Kleiman, a Canadian journalist, uh, some other journalists who ventured out into the countryside to see that with their own eyes. So what you would see is a very gloomy, very gruesome picture of uh, devastated villages. So if in the uh, 1920s, when uh, Ukrainian countryside more or less recovered from the all the fighting for, that followed the revolution, you would see thatched houses with mud houses, with thatched roofs, uh, beautiful paint windows, holy oaks, sunflowers, but obviously not in winter. But you would see just during the new economic policy, you would see normal villages of Eastern Europe with thatched roofs and people bustling and living a pre-modern life in a way, just modern as I am, modern, like peasants into Ukrainians, really, or Ukrainians being peasants, shtetls, Jewish settlements, towns. You would see in the countryside picturesque and uh, very Ukrainian. Whereas in 1933, in spring, you would see people using thatch from their roofs as uh, fuel. They would use that. You would see devastated villages, really. The houses unkept, some abandoned. If you would take major roads, you would see people traveling by food, trying to escape the villages. If you go by rail, you would see people starve and publish in rags at the train station, trying to board the trains without permission to do so, without tickets, but simply because they don't have money or they are not allowed to, without documents, to board the train due to the legis- another legislative act passed earlier in winter prohibiting Ukrainians leaving the republic. So this legislative act was extended to Volga region in February 1933. So we see specific regions targeted. And in Volga region, there was autonomous German Republic. Then we see the closure of borders in Kazakhstan. And those regions that were not loyal to the Bolsheviks during collectivization and not uh, during the civil war. So they are as if they have been punished and so was Ukraine. So you would see people being denied uh, when they tried uh, to board the train in um, Western part of Ukraine, which was uh, now central part of Ukraine, obviously, you would see Jewish shtetl dwellers who are trying to board the train to um, go to the far east, Berbijan, Jewish Autonomous Republic. Families waiting for months to board the train. People trying to escape devastated villages and people dying by the road. You would see mass graves and police uh, trying to contain and um, situation to avoid. Hungry rides, hungry rides uh, at um, the train station where grain is stored before being transported out of the Republic. So it would be a very poignant picture that you would see in the countryside. Victoria, you mentioned earlier about your research into the what you call the rank and file perpetrators of the Holodomor. Could we talk more about these people? Who are they? What do they do? So we have people of all walks of lives. Of life, for example, Stahanovites, celebrated poster girls uh, such as Pasha Angelina, Maria Demchenko, those you can see in the chronicles of um, the five year plan or second year plan, meeting with Stalin, being friendly. Then you have uh, Soviet dissidents who later reflected on their participation and there was some atonement or repentance. Then you have Ordinary people, what you would call just collective farmers who for various reasons participated. But uh, to say more on them, on district level, on village, and we're talking about village officials, headmasters of schools, um, um, heads of village councils or collective farms who were receiving orders from the um, districts to collect grain, to collect valuables, to collect meal, meat and other produce, we see them acting out of the same reasons as uh, any other perpetrators of mass violence and genocides. Majority of them are conformists or followers. There is a vulnerable group, of course, who fear for their own safety and their vul- vulnerability is used by the uh, system to force them, to compromise them into participation. So I would call them compromised perpetrators. So followers are the major group and there are compromised. There are people who are trained to enforce policies with violence, police, 
army and uh, security services, they all took part. There are profiteers, people who participate because they want something, either educational opportunities yeah. or they want to for their children to send them to the university in the cities or they uh, just want to settle scores to get someone's wife or husband or get a better position at the collective farm and so on. And you can belong to a few groups at the same time. And finally, there are very small groups of perpetrators, such as sadists, um, who embrace violence, and they are about 5%, as well as those true believers or fanatics for ideological reasons, which is also 5%. But... Uh, Ultimately, uh, the whole democracy compromised the whole society because there are students, workers, and there are many party officials, uh, civil um, service employees uh, who were sent as plenipotentiaries to the countryside to help green procurement. And some of them became later prominent politicians and Soviet leaders, including Leonid Brezhnev, who was in 1932-33, such a, one of the rank and file perpetrators in Ukraine, in Kamiansky, which is not far from Dnipro in Ukraine. So yes, as in other cases of mass violence, I mean, the whole society is affected. You mentioned Brezhnev there. What do we know about what he did? What would he have been doing when he was helping procure the grain? Yes, that's what he was doing. He was part of Brezhnev, uh, who became the general secretary of the Communist Party of the USA. Uh, he was at the time in the trade union of educational, you know, it was a college, if I'm not mistaken, and he was sent to procure grain. So he was uh, sent to a number of villages to oversee how local activists were conducting searches. So it's house to house search to see whether anybody is hiding grain or any other foodstuffs that could be confiscated in the year of grain. So that was what Brezhnev was involved and he wrote about it in his memoirs. And if we look or read closely memoirs of Soviet political leaders or Soviet celebrities, so to speak, we would find plenty of evidence how they describe those searches, how they describe retribution of fellow villagers for what they did. Or well, the crime, really. Dari, you've spoken about how the Holodomor starts, what happens during it. How does it end? That is a very difficult question. So while all Soviet, the all Soviet famine ends in 1934, we can trace the end of the famine in summer 1933 where green procurement was replaced by tax uh, rather than confiscation of all foodstuffs, when peasants were allowed to leave some food behind from the new harvest. But that is not to say that people stopped dying immediately, and they continued to die from malnourishment and related diseases until 1934, really. So the other crucial decision by the state that contributed to the end of the famine was the permission to keep a vegetable plot or rather to keep produce from the veg privately owned vegetable plot for consumption and the efficiency with which peasants worked or now collective farmers now nobody resisted and joined the collective farms the efficiency with which they worked on those privately owned vegetable plots was so striking that most of what was consumed in the USSR in terms of vegetables was produced on those plots and not in the fields, in collectively owned fields. So that shows obviously in how inadequate collectivized form of agriculture was, but also that peasants continue to feed everyone. And yes, uh, that the famine was completely artificial. It was a political famine. Could you talk a little bit about how the Holodomor was understood and dealt with and treated in, in, Ukraine, in Ukrainian and maybe in Russian society as well? It is important to, when we talk about memory of the Holodomor, to bear in mind that the famine of 1932-33 was experienced differently in Russia and in Ukraine. In Ukraine, it is remembered as an attack on Ukraine. And Rightly so, because uh, Ukraine suffered a considerably higher excess mortality rate that could be only compared with the mortality rate in Kazakhstan. Uh, but these two famines, while they have many parallels, they have many differences which would be beyond the scope of this interview to discuss. 
But in comparison to Belarus and to Russia, Ukrainians died in their thousands per day in spring 1933. And the Holodomor also refers not only to the famine, but also to the concurrent persecution of Ukrainian intelligence and political elite and religious leaders that were active or could be active should Ukraine become uh, independent in case of war. So they were persecuted at the same time as the peasants and in 1932-33 and it started with a show trial of 1930. So here we have the link between, link between social and national. And when there was another party conference in the end of 1933, in autumn 1933, Ukrainian party leaders as well as uh, their colleagues from Russian Federation were no longer hiding the fact that in case of Ukraine, agricultural is the national question. So the question of the countryside is the national question in Ukraine. And because, let's be frank, 80% of the population at the time lived in the countryside. So, of course, this understanding of Ukrainian national movement was very closely related to Ukrainian rural Ukraine. And historical memory was preserved in families. So this from the uh, individual family narrative of the famine, it defined historical memory in Ukraine. And of course, it was silenced pretty much until 1980s, until Glasnost, when it became the surfaced public discussion. It was criminal offense, actually, anti-Soviet agitation to mention that in public, though many writers did in by way of his open language, euphemisms. Blaming it on local officials, we see very vivid discussion in Ukrainian diaspora and post-1991 when it was already put into cultural memory texts, novels, plays, songs, poems. Um, but um, for a long time to be denied even to mourn your loved ones that died as a result of the famine, it left a profound effect on the whole society. And we see a brief opportunity to mourn the dead, to count how many people died and what happened during Nazi occupation of all periods in Ukrainian history. You have Nazi occupation. Obviously, the Nazi authorities used in this crime of Soviet regime and their propaganda and hence Later on, Soviet regime dismissed the Holodomor as Nazi, as the product of Nazi propaganda. So there is a very complex interplay of memory and politics and defining the discourse of the whole um, Holodomor. So after 1991, despite a reluctance of Russia to accept the hard facts, the Holodomor became the center of Ukrainian nation building project. And we're talking about 2006 and under the president of Yushchenko, when this memory of the Holodomor was institutionalized, but it wouldn't have taken root if it was not for family history and memory that it was preserved because the whole of Ukraine experienced the Holodomor and everyone was affected in one way or another. So when historians are dismissing it, either do not know history well, or they did not do it for political reasons, that this memory was alive for all that time. And what we see now is pretty much reckoning with the past. Daria, is there anything we haven't spoken about that you think is important for our listeners to hear? Yes, I believe there is a very exciting and very path-breaking research on the Holodomor made by my Russian colleagues, actually, Russian historians who now work in the West, who dispelled the myth of Holodomor being just a made-up Nazi propaganda, treatment of Nazi propaganda, by looking into exports of grain and what financed industrialization. This research was done by Yelena Sokina, who shows that in 1933, most of industrialization expenses were covered by export of gold by Soviet Union. And if you remember, in the 1933, there were no gold mines in the far east Russian Federation. So the gold was procured from desperate population of Ukraine. He was willing to exchange their family heirlooms for Myanmar abysmally small amounts of food in a state-owned 
chain of uh, shops called Torxin, established exactly conveniently during that time in Ukrainian countryside. So the argument that goes that the grain was needed from cultivation and cultivation was needed to finance industrialization doesn't stand to rigor. And in fact, it was the Great Depression, so the prices for grain on the world market was already um, low. It was gold and it was other income sources that financed industrialization. And the other research by um, Katerina Naumilka shows that Ukrainians suffered higher mortality rates than Russians, even when they lived in Russian Federation. So they were clearly targeted. And that's another brick in the wall, a strong wall of argument that Ukrainians were targeted because they were Ukrainians. And here we're talking about political nation, not ethnic nation. And I cannot escape but seen parallels with the current Russo-Ukrainian war in which Ukrainians of all ethnic backgrounds are targeted because they are Ukrainians, because they resist, just like they did before the Holodomor. But unlike then, we have the West's support and this solidarity can change the tide of history in this attempt of Russia, another attempt of Russia to subdue Ukraine. Dara Mattingly, thank you so much for your time. A few weeks ago, we asked you to send in your thoughts and reflections, as well as where you were listening from. Thank you to everyone who filled up the Telegraph email inbox with your kind words. Here are a short selection. Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. Hi, Ukraine, the latest team. I'm Cornell. I'm listening regularly to your podcast from Stuttgart in Germany. And I really appreciate your British approach, which is much more vivid than the German one. Keep on going and P.S. Uh, be a bit more patient with German politics. We are still trying to get used to play a bit more, a bit bigger role in world politics. Thank you. Hello, Ukraine the latest. This is Kendra from Texas. Uh, I was on the podcast last year, and this is the second voice memo I've ever done. It's just for you guys. Um, I just wanted to call and say thank you so much for covering the news, even though I know I know our media in the United States pretty much stopped covering it, uh, the war. So thank you so much for bringing us updates. I listen every to every single podcast, and you know I hope everybody has a very happy holiday and a wonderful new year. Thank you so much for all the work you do. Bye. My name is Lauri, and I'm from Finland. I've been listening to Ukraine the latest since the start of the full-scale invasion. With 2023 coming to an end, we and the leaders of the free world must ensure Russia's attack is decisively defeated. Stay strong. Hello, my name's Alex, being from Alaska. I just want to say I really appreciate your podcast how it zooms down to the front line, the daily operations and things which are happening, but also zooms right out to the global picture in terms of stability now and in the future. Uh, please keep up the good work and have a Merry Christmas. Hello, Ukraine, the latest. This is Martin from Kiev, Ukraine. I would love to thank you for the amazing podcast you put together for us and for the updates, comprehensive updates and analysis you share with us. The information is so invaluable at this day and time. Thank you for standing with Ukraine. Glory to Ukraine. And I appreciate your work so much, guys. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just one pound at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine The Latest. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. We're also doing the same for what is unfolding in the Middle East. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so that you don't miss it. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review. 
as it helps others find the show. As the disinformation war ramps up, we are relying on your support more than ever. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk and we do read every message. You can also contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we're especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was today produced by Rachel Porter and Giles Gear. Executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells.